Let's uh, kick this off. Good morning, everybody. My name is Ray Hutchins. I'll be one of your presenters here today. Uh, Mitch, I see you're still on mute over there. Um, so here you go. Um, this is a, how accountants can change cybersecurity from a problem to a competitive advantage. Um, so we're gonna, we've got two presenters today, the two owners of Cybersecurity LLC, a cybersecurity company headquartered in Denver, Colorado. Uh, my partner, Mitch Tannenbaum, will be one of the presenters. You're very lucky to have him on today. He is one of the most knowledgeable cybersecurity people in the entire United States of America. Mitch, would you like to say something about yourself and your background, please? Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. We appreciate you spending time with us. Uh, my background includes uh, a, a long history of uh, uh, cybersecurity work in the financial services world, um, banking and the mortgage industry, as well as the defense community. And um, I am a partner in cybersecurity. I have a different background with small businesses and the healthcare industry. You can find out more about us by going to our website at cybersecurity.com. Notice the word security spelled with a C instead of an S. Highly clever, by the way. Um, and I say there, why me on there? Because uh, I'm leading the presentation. Well, you know, in, when you're in the cybersecurity business, it's, it's helpful if you... Uh, can specialize in various industries because of your understanding about how different businesses work. Um, so I teach a course for this company in Colorado called CPE for you, like continuing professional education for you. And um, uh, they, they asked me to teach a course. Um, this is this information is derived from that course, but that's two half days. Uh, of uh, cybersecurity for accountants, parts one and two, how to defend client information, your business, your financial assets from attack, and then how to build a cost-effective security program, prepare for ine inevitable breach. The next time I'll be teaching this course is January 8th and January 15th, 2019. And if you got the email on this, which you did, uh, you'll get an email inviting you to that. This course today, what we're teaching today is at no cost. It's free, obviously. This other course costs some money, uh, but you get CPE credits. So, but it was the building of that course and the teaching of that course that taught me about your industry and taught me about the IRS requirements for your industry. And that's the information that kind of got us the knowledge we needed so that we could serve you better and provide the tools better for the accounting profession. So that's why me. By the way, no technical knowledge required today. Um, if, as, long as, as long as you speak English, you're going to speak the language I'm talking to you in today. No problem on that. Let's start off with the threat, because, I mean, this is an issue. I mean, people, most people don't get it. Uh, that's the reality. Is there a cyber th threat? Is there a threat to our national security? Is there a cyber war going on? If yes, who are the combatants? Where, what are the casualties? What might an attack look like? These are things that, of course, we deal with all the time because we're in the business and we see it happening to our country. But let me tell you, my friends, um, uh, now I have a particular little mindset on this whole thing. All right, I'm ex-military, uh, ex-Air Force. So, you know, I got that military training, which was very beneficial in my life. I'm not a militarist in any way, but, um, but, but I learned some things. And uh, I am freaked out, okay, over what I am seeing. Those are our top weapon systems right there, some pictures of them. But I'm going to make a statement to you right now that's going to freak you a little bit, but um, sorry, it's true. The Chinese have stolen all of our major weapon systems. All of them. Now, whoa, whoa. Now, you don't, don't worry. Don't take my word for it. Just go look it up. Just, just go Google, you know, uh, how many weapon systems have the Chinese stolen? When you find out years ago, uh, DOD and uh, whatnot, Pentagon, they knew about this. Um, but, and, and just yesterday was in the news that the Chinese, uh, that our anti-ballistic missile systems were unsecure. Well, that's part of all the weapon systems. I mean, but the information, so it, it's, shock, it's shocking, uh, but it's true. Um, and, um, and we've got, um, I'm, and a lot of this is because of, uh, well, the leadership in the Pentagon and the political leadership hasn't been attuned to this and hasn't um, 
uh, provided good leadership. They don't understand the problem. They haven't filtered it down to us. But it's not all bad news. Mainly it is bad news, I'm sorry to tell you. I mean, because not only have they stolen all the major weapon systems, uh, the Chinese, at the top level, but there are, in this country there are 300,000 contractors and subcontractors to the DOD military industrial base. 300,000 of these businesses out there. The Chinese are now methodically working their way through those 300,000 right now, taking all of our stuff. What does that mean if we end up having to fight those Chinese over those islands over there in the Pacific? In my personal opinion, let them have those islands, <laughs> you know, at this point, because I mean, it's hard to project power, especially if our guys have to go fighting against their own weapon systems. Anyway, I digress. But this man right here, here's a patriot right here. I said there's we got a leadership problem on cybersecurity. This is a good man. OK, this this guy here is Dan Coates, director of national intelligence at a speech at the Hudson Institute on July 13th, 2018. And you can look that up, just Google that speech. You can get the whole speech. He said, the red lights are blinking. The red lights are blinking. Now, what did he mean when he said that? What he meant was that before those airplanes crashed in those towers in New York um, and collapsed those towers, that the intelligence industry was picking, the red lights were blinking. They knew something was getting ready to happen. This is what he's saying go is going on with cybersecurity right now. Freaky, freaky. So it, it's got my attention, and I hope it's got yours. Um, now, you and me, we're not dealing at the level of um, national cybersecurity, obviously, okay? But what you and I are up against is a billion man opportunistic army. These are not evil people out there, these are people, and they're opportunistic. And they are, it's anyone in the world who's got a computer and internet connection and some smarts can come in here and try to trick us out of our money and our intellectual property and our information. Anyone out there can do that. That's just the nature of the world. And it, by the way, it's not just people in India and Pakistan and Nigeria and, uh, and China, uh, individuals doing it. There's a lot of Americans out there, a lot of Americans that are part of this billion man opportunistic army. There's a lot of industrial espionage going on in the United States between Americans right now, people stealing stuff just because they can. It used to be a situation that if someone broke into your house and stole something out of your house, well, you could get there and the door was broken open and your TVs were gone and whatever. But now these people... That's not the way it works. Now you come in and they're coming into your computer and getting data out of your machine. You don't even know it's gone. They made a copy of it and then they took off. That's what we're up against today. And that's a challenge. But what can we do? We've got to fight. We've got to fight back. Now, here are some cyber patriots right here. These are guys in cyber command right here. And that's their job. They're in the military trying to defend us over there. But there's, they can only defend Defense Department stuff and some government assets. But our stuff, we're out there by ourselves defending what we got. So what we need is the people, us. We have to step up and do it. But what do we do? Well, you're you're there today. You have stepped up today. You have attended this meeting today. You're you are you're one of the patriots, and I salute you. That I salute you for caring enough about it, being aware enough about it being willing to do what's necessary. I salute you. Good for you. We need a lot more like you. Okay. Basic training for you starts right now, soldier. Let's go. Now, this is this is this information we're going to share with you today is going to be for you, your family, and your business. And what you learn today and what you might learn from us in the future, share it. Share it with others. You too become, you can tell right now, that Ray Hutchins, the presenter on this, this pre is into it, okay? He is passionate about it. He believes it. He is an evangelist. We need you to be the same way. You're a believer too, and you're not shy about helping other people know that this is important and everybody has to play the game for us to, to win this battle. It's not easy. Is the country protected? Is your business protected? Is your family protected? Is your computer protected? No, none of it. OK, none of it. All right. So we've got to make the difference. We have to protect. But it can be done. This can be done. Have I spoken any techno babble to you yet? Is there anything in here that you can't understand? There's not going to be a problem. You're going to get the information and you're going to have it. Why aren't patriots more proactive in defending our data and our IT infrastructure? Why aren't they? 
Well, it's not because they're bad people. Come on. I mean, it's no short term loss that they can see and feel. Like I said, people can march into your computer, take your stuff. They're just making copies of it and walk off. You don't know what's even happened many times. And they'll leave a back door open so they can come back in and get it, get more later. If you're not doing anything about it, they don't care. And virtually all the attacks that are occurring are automated attacks. And so, I mean, they don't have to do any work. They're just sending out their bots, trying to about which computers are vulnerable, if they're vulnerable. And if you've got something of interest, like accountants do, you guys have a lot of stuff of interest, then they can come in and take it. But if you just do a little bit of work, you can raise that bar. You want to get that bar up high enough that they have to spend money. If they have to spend money to break in your computer, well, you're going to have a lot fewer attackers, I guarantee you. Second, security is inconvenient. Always security is inconvenient. Remember when uh, they tried to get us all to wear seatbelts in our cars? Inconvenient. We didn't like it. We groused about it. Well, we're doing it now. And now we think, well, God, I got to put on my seatbelt. Same thing with this. It runs against human nature to change. We don't like it. We like things the way they are. Well, things are changing. You want to change? You want to lose what you got? Okay, that's your deal. But anyway, so here, I'm, this is, you got three things. This is the answer. This is the answer to a question. So the answer is breach, customer demand, and compliance. I'll ask my partner, Mitch, what's the question? Why do people come talk to us about cybersecurity? That is correct. Mitch has got that. People don't come to us voluntarily. Now, it does happen that we will have an enlightened business leader occasionally say, you know, I'm responsible for all this information over here. I'm responsible for this data and I know I'm not doing enough about it and I'm reading the news. I need to do something about it. Now, that does happen. But usually it's because someone was breached or they have a customer telling them, I can't do business with you unless you get your act together or they have a regulatory compliance issue. That's what's driving, well, fine. That's one way of getting the job done. But uh, I mean, you know, it's time to quit wasting. We need to all get moving on this thing. And so you are, again, I salute you, all right? Compliance in the accounting profession. You accountants, lawyers, doctors, you guys, you are the big professionals. You're the ones with great amounts of data and information about us. You have a special, uh, you're licensed professionals. You are people who uh, we hold at a higher level of trust in our society. So therefore, um, uh, well, you guys have to do more. You're leaders. What external cybersecurity rules and by the way, uh, if you have any questions out there, um, feel free to pop them uh, to us and we will answer your questions. Um, and um, so uh, once you know, this can be very interactive. Uh, what external cybersecurity rules and regulations apply to the accounting profession? And what are the legal, ethical and moral responsibilities of the accounting profession? You already may know some of these answers, uh, but let's hit it. You've got quite a few. Quite a few things that drive the conversation with the accounting profession. GLBA has been around for a while, and um, uh, and that definitely applies to you, the graham leach bliley Act. Federal Trade Commission financial privacy and safeguard rules, we're going to touch on those here in just a little bit. I throw in here the Colorado protections for consumer privacy law. Now, I know that uh, we've got quite a few attendees here, and a lot of you all over the country, um, but... Um, we're based in Colorado, and we have a new consumer privacy law that was passed here with 100% support of the legislature, by the way, 100%, um, both sides of the aisle. How rare does that happen? Uh, but uh, so in these laws, state laws are being passed all over the country. Um, and, um, and so you've got the New York Department of NYDFS, that's New York Department of Financial Services Regulation. That's kind of like the, the big one in the country right now, very prescriptive. They they tell you about uh, very detailed what kind of cybersecurity program you should have. The California Consumer Privacy Act, um, which is a uh, uh, starting in Colorado, in California, it might be the it might be the basis for a national privacy security law. Something the United States does not have. Europe has one. GDPR. You might have heard about that. But the United States doesn't have one yet, but there's uh, California's got uh, a law out there. And then, of course, for you guys, 
you've got the IRS publications 452, 445, and 1345. We will go over these here shortly and uh, uh, give you a glimpse into these things. And there's more. So there's, there's quite a bit out there that relates to you guys. Why? You got all this, you got this information. You've got all this, you got all the tax documents and financial information and inf if people get steal your files they've got everything they know to attack your clients and um uh and impersonate them so um uh it, it's a dangerous situation um the um um Mitch, what is the, um, I don't, know, don't mean to put you on the spot, but I know you can do it. Mitch, by the way, one of the reasons Mitch is such a powerful cybersecurity authority is because Mitch has an almost um, photographic memory. So for all of us out here that don't have such a thing residing in our craniums, um, I can tell you from working with this man uh, that uh, is an amazing uh, resource to have him. Like I can throw a question at him like, Mitch, what are the ethical uh, responsibilities uh, for accountants? And Mitch can go back into his mental database and regurgitate the following. Mitch, can you please tell me that? Well, uh, accountants have a code of conduct, professional code of conduct that they uh, agree to participate in. Um, you know, the AICPA certainly has uh, re recommended uh, code of conduct, and um, you know the, the expectation on the part of the general public is that uh, you know the professional code of conduct um, that people like accountants and lawyers have uh, it requires them to operate in the best interest of their client and to take reasonable measures to go protect the information that they're entrusted. One of the challenges is uh, we see we just saw this with the Marriott breach is that. Yeah, hackers can be in your system for, literally for years and you not have any visibility to that, right? We saw with the Marriott breach, there was, you know, the hackers got in there four years ago. The The Starwood uh, hotel chain was acquired by Marriott. They did obviously some form of due diligence, obviously inadequate due diligence, but they did some due diligence and, and they did not detect the guys in there. And then, you know, somewhere, somehow, the attackers finally, after four years, stepped on a landmine and they got detected. So the interesting question would be, you know, are you any more protected than than the Marriott folks were in terms of would you know if somebody was even in there? And that's part of your ethical responsibility to make sure that um, you are protecting your client's data. And as Ray said, one of the challenges you have is unlike when someone breaks into your house and steals your electronics, there's if the, if the hackers know what they're doing there is very little telltale evidence of the fact that they've taken it. Thank you, Mish. And did you all see how he was able to regurgitate that on command? That's just amazing. Here's something else. We do, we work with accounting firms to help them do SOC 2 um, audits. And, um, uh, and and Mitch is very, very versed in, um, you know, the details and whatnot around that. Um, and so if you guys are doing that, if, uh, you guys are members of AICPA and doing such things and need accounting, a, a real cybersecurity expert to help you do um, uh, SOC 2 uh, related to cybersecurity uh, work, uh, we can certainly help you with that. So um, let's go, whoops, where was I here? Go right here. Uh, okay. The um, FTC, financial institutions, is defined by the FTC. Uh, and that safeguards rule include professional tax preparers, that's you, data processors, their affiliates, and service providers, service providers, agents. So you're covered the col in the Colorado law. And by the way, I'm bringing this up. Who's who's covered? Uh, I mean, who do, who do these various regulations reply, apply to? And um, well, obviously, you guys, you guys have so much information. I mean, it, it just applies to you. Don't think that it doesn't apply to you. Like the Colorado law, you, you'll have your own laws in your own state. But in Colorado, the Colorado applies to anyone whose customers are in Colorado. OK, so it's not just the location of your practice, but whose customers are. So, I mean, that's the way the laws are worded many times um, for, you know, in California, New York and whatnot. So even if you have customers in other states, 
you have to comply with it. So let's There's, take a pause here for a second, Ray. That's an important distinction. So as of 2018, every single state in the country and a few of our territories have privacy laws on the books. And every one of those privacy laws is different, which is why there's some push at a national level for a national privacy law. Uh, whether that happens in 2019 is anyone's guess, but uh, Congress is not super functional, so I'm not counting on that. But the challenge you have as a uh, accounting professional is that if you have clients in multiple states, then you're required to comply with the regulations of the states in which your customers live, not just the state in which you operate. So for example, in Colorado, there is actually no exemption for any business of any type, uh, tax exempt or nonprofit or even municipalities. Uh, and there's no, there's no um, uh, minimum size for compliance with the law. Everybody has to comply with the law. Uh, and so you know, those, there are certain requirements in terms of, of what you have to do from a security program and how long you have to notify people in case of a breach and who you have to notify and things like that. Every state is different, which is a real challenge for organizations that have clients who live in many states. So, you know, one of the things to go look at is, you know, where do your clients live and what laws are applicable to you based on where your clients live. Right. Um, and then the last point of making here, the IRS, of course, the IRS is you basically your overlord. And, um, and, and so it, you're, it, all of this applies to you guys. Um, so there's three IRS publications that we're going to talk about, 4557, 1345, and 4524. So 4524, that's really a security awareness for your clients, the taxpayers. It's a one-page document. Um, 1345, we're not going to go into today, but it has to do with e-file providers. Uh, and and there is some stuff applicable to you. Um, sometimes it's applicable to um, systems that you might be using. But 4557, that's the one targeted directly at you. And that's the one we're going to, I'm going to go into some more detail on here today to give you an overview of what's in there. And, uh, and by the way, I want to say a cybersecurity provider, like God, we're, we're cybersecurity guys, we read, we know what's going on in cybersecurity. We read a lot of stuff. We belong to all the associations. You know, Mitch writes one of the best cybersecurity blogs in the country. We're informed. And I want to tell you what, what IRS did, and I was very surprised about this when I got into this, the quality of the work that they did, the money that they spent as they put together the information here in that 4557 and these other, is very, very good. You can count on it. I was expecting it to be, you know, half-baked and not well-informed and uh, you missing the mark, maybe, you know, 50% of use or whatnot. Nope, it was, it's good. It's good stuff. So you can have confidence in it. That's our opinion on this thing. So good yeah. stuff. They did good work. And let me point out that if you uh, had looked at 4557 earlier, it was revised in the middle of, of this year, and it's dramatically changed from the earlier versions. Yeah, yeah, now, good stuff. So uh, you can use it. Um, so looking at four, five, five, seven here, the table of contents. So it's got six sections to the table of contents, and we're going to go through this to give you an introduction, so you can see what's in this thing and what they're covering. Again, they did a good job. Uh, you can see the six sections here. I don't have to read them to you, and we're going to touch through them as we're going through here. So in the introduction, but this is important here. Data security is now a necessity for every tax professional, okay? Every employee, both professional and administrative staff, should be educated about security threats and safeguards. There you go, okay? Now, after um, uh, when we get through with this um, webinar today, um, if you want uh, a link to it, because we're recording it right now, if you want a link to it for your staff, for other people involved, let us know. I'll send you the, the link. Um, and, um, uh, and you can uh, have your other people. Be, this will Every employee, both professional, everyone should go through this little course I'm giving you right now. Protecting tax number two, protecting taxpayer payer data is the law. You must create and enact a security plan. You must follow the six security and privacy standards. And they're not saying it's an optional thing. They're saying you got to do this stuff. And protecting taxpayer data is good business. Consider engaging security professionals. We are security professionals. 
you don't have to know, you don't have to meet any more cybersecurity people. You found two of them and you can tell we're on the job. Now I want to tell you something about our client data protection policy. We, if anyone is a client of us, we have something to protect, right? How do we protect our data? Okay. Well, this is a device that you need to make note of right here. That's a, called an Apricorn hard drive. For a small operation, and we are a small company in Denver, Colorado, we're not a huge uh, company. Um, and so when we get client data, all of our client data is on this device. This, this device is about, uh, it's not, it looks like a pack of playing cards. It's bigger than a pack of playing cards, but not much bigger. Um, and it is an external encrypted hard drive. You plug this into your computer, and if you're a client of mine, all of the data related to you is on my Apricorn hard drive. If someone hacks into my computer, there is no data on any of our clients. It's just not there. Uh, it's on that hard drive. And the only way you can get into that hard drive is to physically type in that code, the, the, the code number, uh, the, the password code number on the outside of the device. If I lose that device, if that physical device is lost, you got to know the code before you can get into it, you know? And so um, uh, for you, if, if you have a small practice and you're wondering, wondering how to uh, uh, encrypt, protect your data, this is one of the ways that it can be done. And so uh, this particular device plays heavily into our own client data protection program. Okay. So uh, first step of 4557, protect your clients, protect yourself. They got five sections in there that they cover. Take basic security steps, use security software, create strong passwords, secure wireless networks, protect stored client data. Good stuff, good stuff. Let's drill down just a little bit more and show you take, uh, so let's be on guard. Um, now how did I do this? Let me see, I'm getting, um, going backwards here. Protect your clients, be on guard. So I'm, I'm kind of going through the high level here and then we're gonna drill down. So we're in section three there, be on guard. Sorry about that, I had to um, be on guard. So now we're gonna drill down to be on guard in here. So I'm not gonna read all these out to you. Um, we're, we're not gonna go in here. There are, um, the, but ver this, the, the details of what information uh, IRS has given you is very good stuff here. So if you're trying to spot data theft, these are the clues that they're giving you. Now, let's just drop down to the second to the last little bullet there. Computer cursors moving or changing numbers without touching the keyboard. Hello? If you see that going on, if you walk in and you see a cursor moving around or numbers are you, Mitch, what does that mean? Well, it means obviously somebody else is operating your computer, and that's certainly one scenario that can happen. But the absence of that does not mean the absence of bad guys. It just means that they're using a different technique other than a remote control software. But that's fairly common. You know, you go click on a link, it installs remote control software, and then uh, you know the the hackers will go off and and try to operate your computer when they think you're not around, like two o'clock in the morning, if your computer is turned on. Obviously, if your computer is turned off at night, then um, you know that's that's not going to work for the bad guys. And that's you know, uh, Ray you know disconnects his his computer from the internet at night, and you know that's because that's oftentimes when attacks occur. And uh, you know if you do that, if you shut the computer down or disconnect from the internet, then uh, it makes the that one attack vector uh, impossible. Exactly, exactly. But, but but I was giving you an example. These are good clues that the IRS has put together. Very practical stuff. Um, be on guard. Monitoring your EFIN and PTINs. Um, and, you know, um, uh, IRS works with you on this. They put together people and um, I don't know if it's a division or an office over there at IRS or whatnot, but helping helping tax preparers protect client data and they've got people who are experts on this and bringing showing you techniques and whatnot to protect information so think of them as an ally we have not heard of any time of any 
uh, accountant or tax preparer cooperating with the IRS and reporting a breach or anything, getting in trouble in any way. No, no. They are looking for people to cooperate with. This will be a star in your bonnet, a feather in your bonnet. Uh, if you work with them, um, become known to them because they know that you care about it and you're working on it and you're trying on this. Being on guard, recognizing phishing scams. Now, they focus on this quite a bit because this is the main way that you're going to be attacked. Someone's going to send you an email. You're going to click on the wrong link. You're going to be um, get some code in your computer and you're going to be attacked. And so they focus on this and give you information but it's, and it's very, very practical and very easy to do. Again, all of your staff should be reading this and be aware of this. And we're going to go into this a little bit more, but notice this, that's number three, recognize phishing uh, scams. And number four is being guarding against phishing emails. So they go a little bit further. They start to get educated employees are the key. Yes, yes, yes. Educated employees. You don't have to spend a fortune to have a cybersecurity program. We're going to show you that later in this in this deal here. We're going to, you don't have to spend a fortune. You have to spend some money, yes. But it's mainly learning what to do. That's mainly what is in getting your people up to speed and then documenting stuff and whatnot. It's, it's a change of habits. It's a change of behavior. It's getting some knowledge. That's mainly what it's about. Um, and and it, it they give you... and it's, do not respond to suspicious on un, 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 or unknown emails if IRS related forward to phishing. They even give you a place to send, um, you know, uh, emails like that. Be safe on the Internet. Well, the Internet is a dangerous place, man. I mean, when it was built, um, it was not built with security in mind. And, um, and it's an amazingly powerful tool, as we all know. It's a great thing. Basically, all of us each human being on earth who has access now has access to all the knowledge of humanity in one place. We can get it, but you also have access to basically every gangster on earth. And so you've got to be careful out there. There's a lot of trickery going on out there, but again, it's knowledge. You just have to be more informed and not being afraid of your computer and learning a little bit more about it. Again, I'm not speaking highly technical information to you. I'm not talking techno battle to you. I'm just talking to you. It, it, you don't have to be a technical person to get this. Um, reporting and responding. Reporting data lost to the IRS and to the states. You've got to cooperate. They want you to cooperate. Um, that's, uh, that's interesting. I just got a question a minute ago. Uh, cyber insurance. Here's a question came in from one of you guys out there. Um, should I report a breach um, to my uh, cyber insurance company? Uh, and the answer is, uh, and it was, you know, or the rates are going to go up. And the, and the answer is, yes, you need you want all the help you can. And we know that the cyber insurance companies, if you have cyber insurance, they are not raising your rates right now is a buyer's market for cyber insurance. Um, you uh, you can get a great deal in cyber insurance. If you don't have all the coverage that you need, you can easily negotiate with them. They'll give you more coverage. That's a whole topic in its own right, which we'll touch on a little bit more a little bit later. But uh, report it. Also report data loss to IRS and to states. Don't be afraid to report that you're having a problem. Um, it's, uh, you, you need the allies, and they want your cooperation out there. Um, so here's some more information about how to report to the states and how to do it. Uh, and they give you down the last bullet down there for a complete checklist. See the data theft information for tax professionals. Uh, once again, the IRS has gone to a lot of trouble trying to figure this out and then make it easy for you. They have gone to the trouble and they are your allies in this and they are strong allies. And uh, and you that's the way you need to look at it. Uh, not, they're not adversaries to you. Um, what uh, this is a little bit more information about uh, recovering from a data loss, some stuff. And again, I don't want to go into great detail reading this to you other than to make you make you aware that this information is in here and that there are different things that you need to learn about in here and things that more things that we're going to cover in just a little bit about what comprises a, um, a good and credible cybersecurity program for accountants. One of the things you highlighted in that slide is is uh, local backups. 
And, you know, we see an amazing amount of ransomware attacks where someone in your office clicks on a file or clicks on a link and, and downloads some malware and all the files in your office, all the files in that computer get encrypted. A lot of times that, that malware will also encrypt any backups that it finds. So one of the things that you want to do is have a, at least one generation of backup, which is offline, unplugged, not powered on, because that's going to be really hard for someone to hack. That's correct. Uh, another question came in real quick here is talking about enforcement with the states. How are states enforcing cybersecurity privacy laws? Uh, the, what they're looking for, if, if they're enforcing it, we have some we have some direct connections with the attorney general's office in Colorado. And what they're saying is, look, if if, if you have a breach and you, uh, you know, you report it, the only time that they're getting rough with people is if you're doing nothing. If you're doing nothing and they come in and they, you've done, you've been asleep at the wheel, it's clear you don't give a damn about the thing and you haven't tried at all, they're going to they're gonna cause you some grief. But if you've got any evidence over there and documented that you're trying, you're working on it, you care about it, you know, then that's what they want. That's what they're looking for. So I uh, hope that answered the question. I could go deeper in that, but we've got limited time here. Complying with the FTT, FTC safeguards rule. Um, you've got to put in a program and you got to regularly monitor and test it. I mean, that's a, and you got to, it gives you some basic rules here, designate one or more employees to coordinate the program. Someone's got to be in charge. You've got to, got to look at what are the risks. You got to have a program. You've got to be careful about your service providers, make sure that, that they care about it too. And then you've got to always adjust the program and keep it going. I mean, no big deal to any of this stuff. I mean, it's a change, but uh, you know, it's just, it's just what you do. Uh, it, we depend on IT for everything we're doing nowadays. So you've just got to have some IT security in there. That's just, it's just part of it. Um, uh, and here's a little bit more about this rule in here that, um, that I can share these slides with you uh, in the, if you want the link and you can read this. And this is in the 455 publication in here. So it's, um, a little bit more I'm not going to read. Was there anything in here? Management, tra employee training. That's a big deal. Always employee training. Um, and not all of these recommendations apply to the circumstances in your offices. I mean, but they're good guides. And they know that. Not everything that they're talking about applies to everybody. Uh, the bigger the office, the more it's going to apply, more of it's going to apply. Sometimes if you're a smaller office, it's less. Sometimes we deal with, we deal with very small accounting offices three people, you know, something like that. Their incident, what's their incident response plan? Because you need an incident response plan. We tell them your incident response, if you have, an, if you have a problem and you can see it going on, that someone's hijacked your co computer or you've got evidence of a problem, unplug your computer from the internet and call Ray and Mitch. That's it. That's all you got to do. If you're a big company, well, then you need a full incident response program and every, you've got to have to have a team. You have to have people swing into action. But it just depends on your situation in here. And that's what they're saying in there as well. Is this stuff easy? No, it's not easy. It requires a change. It requires some work. It requires some attention to detail. True. But it can be done. And, and now we're going to get into um, when I'm doing that course for the CPE for you that I told you about they wanted me to talk about how to build a cost-effective security program and prepare for the inevitable breach. So that Mitch and I, we sat down to build a program for accountants. How can we build a cost-effective program for them that gets them where they need to go and they don't spend that much money for, for a smaller company? And uh, if you go to this link right there, cybersecurity.com forward slash accountant cybersecurity certification program, that link right there. If you just go, if you just go to our main website and just go to our programs and click on the accounting program, you'll find the program there as well. And I'm going to go through the program for you right now so you can see what's involved in this program and that it's not that big a deal. It has 15 components to it. The Accountant Cybersecurity Certification Program, which means if you do everything that we tell you in here, we will certify you and, and, uh, and you will have a, a certification on your um, on your site that shows that you've accomplished this. Now we're not going to put our name on your website unless you do what we tell you to do on this thing, but we will, um, and we've got a process for it. 
So here's the 15 things. Let's go through that. So you've got to have a cybersecurity network risk assessment. Okay, that's an assessment that we send you and you fill out the questions and then Mitch reviews, reviews them, asks you some more questions and we get an understanding of just where are you? And most of you are nowhere. We already know that, but you've got to have an assessment and it's got to be documented because now you know what you need to fix. Then you have to have a written data security plan, DSP, we call it. You have to have a written plan. Well, we provide you with this plan. I mean, we've, we've got it for you in there. You have to have a data security plan management spreadsheet. Now, you don't have to have one, one of these. We provide this for you. It's a spreadsheet, and it's got various tabs on it where you document different parts of your program. I'm going to go into some more detail on this as we go through here, but um, cybersecurity policy package. We provide, you have to have some cybersecurity policies. Um, you know, like our policy is we train all of our employees uh, in cybersecurity awareness training. And that consists of we do some phishing testing and we provide some other information and everyone has to do this on a periodic basis. That kind of, that's a policy. That's our policy to do that. You have to have some other policies. I'll show you in a minute. You have to have an incident response program. Is it a full program or is it call Ray and Mitch? Well, you have, you've, got to, you've got to have a program. You've got to have cybersecurity awareness training program, including. Now, our program includes the following. Professional security awareness training, including an unlimited phishing training for up to 25 staff. We have we have looked at let me look through here question. Okay, so I'll go into more detail on that in a second. But you've got cybersecurity awareness training, small business encryption techniques, can talk about that, insurance policy primer, checklist recommendations, cybersecurity due diligence and company valuations. Oh, interesting subject matter for you guys. We'll talk about it in a little bit. We'll give you the uh, IRS publications, 4557. Also, we'll give you a draft client engagement letter language because you want your clients to know that you have a security aware practice. We're going to talk about open DNS in just a little bit. And then we give you some of our time, two hours of one-on-one -on -one virtual chief information security officer consulting and three hours of information technical support, and then the certification if you do everything we tell you to do above. So let's drill down just a little bit. We've got 15 minutes late left. I wanna show you some details of this. So we talked about the risk assessment. We talked about the data security plan. We talked about the data the DSP management spreadsheet bit. Um, the, the spreadsheet's great because it puts your whole program in one area for you where everything is documented and you stay on top of everything that you're doing in there. So that's an important management tool that you get in the program. Uh, you get your policy package and it depends on how many policies you need. 10 is a minimum uh, that we get in there. We'll give you some, uh, the policies and they're basic policies. For bigger companies, we have more advanced policies. But for you guys, we've got some, uh, some basic policies for you that will be what you need. Incident response program, we've talked about that a little bit. Uh, we'll give you a, a full one if you need one, but most people need a, a much simplified version for it, uh, which is just fine. As long as you've got a program, you have to have a program and know what to do. Okay, now let's talk about this security awareness training program a little bit. So we have looked at, there are 22 online security awareness training programs out there available. Well, we have looked at all of them. And we narrowed it down to two, one that we call the Cadillac program. Um, and that's if you want it all, man. And that's Wombat, Wombat. Then you've got the Chevy uh, that is in our very good and plenty good enough. And that's called No Before. OK, so we've found we we if you uh, buy our program here. Um, which, by the way, anyone waiting has cost $7,850. So, I mean, even less to you guys today. So no, let's just take that mystery out of your mind. It's not that much money. and But you get no before it rolled into it. Um, and so that gives you a phishing training module. You can have an automated phishing program is going to people out there. And, and it's just great. You just have to have that. And so you get that as part of this deal here. And, it, and so it's an important part to this thing. Then you get access to Mitch, Mitch's side blog. Again, he's one of the, has one of the best cybersecurity blogs in the country, all in English, nothing technical. We give you ransomware training. One of our 
uh, videos on ransomware training of a presentation that I did on that. It goes in great depth on ransomware training. Protect your family money training. This is a great thing. This is not about cybersecurity. It's just protecting your family money. This is one of our most popular presentations uh, when Mitch and I talk about everything that a couple of cybersecurity guys have learned about um, helping people protect their family money. Um, uh, it's great information that you need to disseminate to your clients, as a matter of fact, because there's so many people out there trying to steal your money through various ways, and now they can come in on their computers and steal the money from you. Uh, then we've got technology enhancement and digital anonymity, tra anonymity training. This evolved from an FBI course. They started it, and we added some stuff to it, and we give you that training. And then we go into the Colorado law. If you happen to work in Colorado, have your practice in Colorado, we go into this law. We have some training around that law. So this is all part of your cybersecurity awareness training program. This gives you everything that you need to really jump up your, your knowledge on things and keep, keep yourself up to speed on stuff. So that's just great. Uh, number seven, small business encryption techniques and solutions. Mitch put this thing together. What a great piece of work this is. This helps you solve your encryption problems. If you, if the Apricorn idea I gave you earlier doesn't work because you're bigger than that, this will help you solve this problem. We'll give you that. Cyber insurance policy primer, checklist, recommendations. We know about cyber insurance. We are called upon, one of the things we do is we, re we review companies' cyber insurance policies for them because who can read those things? How do you know if you've got the right protection or not? Well, that's something we do for our clients. And we provide you with some basic information about that so that you can buy a policy that really has meaning for you and has value for you. That's, that's an important thing for people to understand. <clears throat> cyber insurance policies are not regulated by any of the state insurance commissions. They're called non-standard form policies. And the, the insurance companies are excess lines insurers. So uh, again, you can't go back to the insurance commission and complain. So it's important that you understand what you get. A lot of times people will go off and they have a professional liability policy and, and the insurance agent says, well, you know, for another hundred bucks, we'll, we'll give you some cyber insurance. And, and you say, well, that sounds like a good deal, but, but you don't really get what you need. So it is important to understand that there's a lot of variability in that uh, particular domain and uh, uh, a lot of times we look at client policies and it's like boy you know it's a good thing you haven't had a breach yet because this wouldn't really help you very much that's that's exactly right um, thanks um, cyber security due diligence and company valuations okay accountants are always involved in helping people sell their businesses or buy new businesses and whatnot and accountants are involved many time in doing financial due diligence. Well, nowadays, folks, you have to do cybersecurity due diligence, and uh, we provide some information about this subject matter. We help accountants do this particular portion, help accountants or, or their clients uh, do cybersecurity due diligence. You take me in on behalf of a buyer of any company in today's world, and we can look at their cybersecurity and odds are they have done the, the company they're trying to buy. Odds are they don't have jack for cybersecurity and their intellectual property has not been protected. And we will knock 20% off that sales price very fast because we can prove they haven't done a good job protecting their intellectual property. Go now, back and look at that Marriott breach, right? They bought Starwood two years ago. You know, they're going to spend a half a billion dollars now. And that's going to come out of... Marriott's shareholders' pockets because Marriott didn't do, and oh yeah, by the way, some of the class action lawsuits, I think there's 14, have been filed asking for class action status so far. Some of those lawsuits are saying that the Marriott directors are liable because, gee, they didn't do very good due diligence. Now you're going to cost me half a billion dollars. Exactly. Exactly. If we're, if we're working on behalf of the seller, first thing we're going to do is we're going to take a look at cybersecurity and we're going to get things squared away on cybersecurity before that thing hits the market. And so the, the very first thing you say is our cybersecurity is good. Our intellectual property has been protected. We, we, we have our act together. Therefore, the company is worth more 
and, uh, and we can defend this valuation. This is an important thing. We've got information in this package about that to help you, plus we're your allies on that. We, of course, will provide you with the IRS documents that we're talking about right here. Uh, we will uh, continue on that. Uh, we'll also give you a draft client engagement letter language. I mean, all your new clients and all your clients, you want to tell them up front, hey, we care about cybersecurity over here. And if we're sending information back and forth, um, you know, uh, it's got to be protected. We just can't sell, send it in an email. We can't have your sensitive information being sent in an email anymore. That dog doesn't hunt anymore. But we got to do this kind of stuff. And if for some reason you don't want to cooperate with us, well, if you sign this um, uh, this form here that says you're not going to cooperate and absolves me of any um, um, risk or liability, okay, uh, we can go forward. But uh, this is an important thing. This is, so that your your clients will appreciate the fact that you're trying to protect their data. Um, open DNS, hands off. Black. Now this sounds. Oh, here's some. He said he wasn't going to talk technical on me, and uh, and he's got this open DNS. Why is he dropping this on me? And what in the world is it? Um, Mitch, I'll let you explain that, please. So DNS is the thing that translates the, the website name that you use in your browser into something that, that the Internet understands. A first line of defense is a service which goes off and looks at those websites that you're trying to go to, like what happens when you click on a link in a malicious email, and, and will block access to any traffic which it knows is malicious. Now, nothing's perfect. But what we want is a layered defense here. And this is one of the, the defense in depth layers. And the advantage of using OpenDNS is a free version and a, and a paid version. The advantage is that this is something that your users do not need to do any action. Once it's been installed, there's nothing to do other than go do your normal business. And it works whether they're in the office, at home, or God forbid, using Starbucks Wi-Fi. So in this, we provide you with information about this. Yes, this has a little technical aspect. It's no big deal. You just you get this for free or very low cost, and it is an amazingly important cybersecurity product that your business needs to be using. Any business needs to be using this. We bring it in here because there's a lot of different cybersecurity products out there, and we're called on by clients all the time to evaluate pro new products, uh, assess those vendors. Um, and we have found that this is one that's like, you know, got to do it, got to do it kind of a thing. So we make this part of the package. Um, okay. We also provide you, if you're building any kind of cybersecurity program, you need some help. Okay. So, all right, we'll be your help. We give you two hours, virtual chief information security officer. This is a position that big companies have. M most companies cannot afford or do they do not need a full-time CISO, CISO, we call it. Um, so we have a virtual CISO program where Mitch Tannenbaum becomes your, that means you've got a go-to person. You've got someone you can ask questions of if you have a cybersecurity question. You get two hours. If you want more, if you need more hours, you can pay for them later, but you got two hours. That, that'll cover you for getting through this program. And uh, so you get some time uh, with him uh, as your consultant, and you have someone on board that you can point to. That's part of a good program. And then you get three hours of implementation or technical support as you're building your program. And so those, and then the, the last part of the cybersecurity certification uh, or cybersecurity program is we will certify you. Uh, if you do this stuff, if you follow our program, and you can find more information about our certification on that page that I showed you a minute ago, the uh, Accountant Cybersecurity Certification Program on our website, um, it'll, it'll tell you more about how this works. Just go there and take a look at it or send an email, we'll be happy to explain it to you. All of these you get. And now if you get certified by us, if you get certified by us, which we highly encourage, by the way, it's not that hard, you're going to attract and retain security sensitive customers. That's the edge you're going to get. You're going to gain a competitive edge over your security disadvantaged competitors. And believe me, you got a world of them out there aren't paying attention a bit in the accounting field. You're gonna reduce your risk and your legal exposure, good thing. You're gonna increase your insurability and even possibly reduce your cyber insurance premiums. If you've got a program in place, you gotta tell your cyber insurance company about it and try to knock that premium down. 
build a positive reputation with employees, clients, vendors, regulators. It's all good. It's all good. So you get these benefits. What's your cost? Normally it's 7850. It's not that much money to start with because we've got a program organized. If you, if you, and I know all your names because I got you down here on this webinar, if you sign up with us pretty quickly, we'll knock off $595 off and you pay it in two installments, 3925, 3330. I mean, we can't make it any easier. Clearly, we're not making a fortune off of it, but we get you started with your program. I mean, um, so you can have a program. You can do it um, out there. That's us. That's who we are. You can reach us easily. You always talk to the owners of the company. And there you have it, my friends. And we're just about at 10 o'clock. So I got through all of that. Any questions? Any more questions out there? Let me check here. If anything new has come in. No, don't have any more questions other than those first two. You got a question, now's your moment. Mitch, you got any final words? Yeah, you made a comment. Go back one slide. Yeah. Right. Oops, let me get back over here. Okay. Yeah. Uh, oh, one more. One more. Okay. Talked about the increasing the insurability and possibly reducing your premiums. Um, we're seeing more and more insurance companies that are looking at your cybersecurity program, but doing a risk assessment, they're using tools to go off and, and try to understand their risk. We saw recently um, one insurance carrier who is uh, looking at uh, organizations' cybersecurity posture and denying insurance if they don't like the, the cybersecurity posture. So even if you have insurance today, you know it may well be next year you go back to renew and and they say you know they and some of these guys are, are using automated scoring systems like BitSight and they don't even have to ask you they'll just come back and say no we're not interested in renewing your policy this year thanks for for having insurance with us last year. Yeah, that's good. And the quicker you get started, the better. Oh, something else we've been hearing about for years is that banks have been thinking about making, if you go in and apply for a loan with a bank, that cybersecurity is, is a risk. So they're making you get a cybersecurity risk assessment before they give you a loan. Now, I'm not hearing a lot of it happening yet, but I'm hearing more about that. So you can expect that anytime. So the sooner, so that's something you need to be telling your clients too, uh, that if a client's going in for a loan proactively, if they have a cybersecurity program, I would throw that on the table and say, hey, this is how serious I am about my business and protecting my intellectual property and protecting my risk and the risk to the bank. Let me show you my program. You think that banker's not going to be impressed by that? I think so. All right. On that note, class is out, team. Good luck to you out there, and I salute you again. Give us a call if you need any help.